For the last 27 years, the face of the Pokemon franchise has been an electric type, so it seems only right that I attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke using only electric type Pokemon. Electric types are known for their incredible speed and special attack stats, but that's pretty much all they have going for them. Defensively, they're very frail, and their move pools are shockingly limited, especially in early generations. That lack of type coverage is going to be a serious issue when it comes to defeating one of the multiple gym leaders that have teams that resist our electric attacks, including a few that are flat out immune to them. On top of all that, there were only five possible encounters available for this challenge. One small mistake could mean the end of this run. As always, a full list of the rules will be in the description down below, but in short, I can only use electric type Pokemon in battle, I can't overlevel my Pokemon, and I can't use items in battle. Let's get started. Just like in the anime, I begin in Pallet Town, but our stories quickly diverge as Professor Oak won't be giving me a Pikachu to accompany on my journey. Pikachu is the only electric type Pokemon available prior to the first gym, but because this isn't the anime, I can't possibly get past Brock with just a Pikachu. The solution to this problem comes by solving a different problem I would be encountering later on in the run, as both Magnemite and Electabuzz are only available in the power plant. With the power of persuasion, I'm able to convince Professor Oak to give me a Magnemite as my starter Pokemon instead of Squirtle, which according to him is quite energetic. I name them Bolts, and they have a hasty nature, which is plus speed and minus defense. Bolts seems lonely though, so in order to find them a friend, I head to Viridian Forest where there's a 5% chance of encountering a Pikachu. I eventually find one and catch him and name him Mouse Rat. His jolly nature might not be the best for battle, but it is great for team morale. The good times might be coming to an end though, as we make it to Pewter City where we're going to face Brock and his Rock-type Pokemon. Many of you might be thinking the main reason I chose Magnemite as a starter is because of their tendency to learn the move Sonic Boom in an early level. While that is an astute observation, Magnemite doesn't learn it until level 16. With a level cap at 14, that means I'm going to have to try and beat his Rock-type Pokemon with tackles and quick attacks. Thankfully neither of his Pokemon know any Ground-type moves, otherwise this would be impossible. I lead with Mouse Rat vs Geodude. My plan is to lower his defense with Tail Whip, which he'll be able to offset with Defense Curl. On the turns he doesn't go for Defense Curl though, he'll go for Tackle, and I'm hoping that he'll get paralyzed from our Static ability. The problem with this though is I'm going to need Mouse Rat to be able to do the same thing to his Onyx, so I can't have him take too much damage against Geodude. After two tackles, Mouse Rat is down to 22 HP and we don't get the Paralysis from Static, so I have to swap to Bolts. The second part of my plan consists of relying on 55% accuracy Supersonic in order to confuse Geodude, and with him at minus one defense, he can do a decent amount of damage to himself if he happens to hurt himself in confusion. The first Supersonic connects, but he breaks through and gets back to even with a defense curl. Tackle obviously does next to nothing, but he manages to hurt himself in confusion and does a decent chunk of damage to himself. After a while, Bolts is able to chip away at him, but then gets hit with a critical hit tackle, which now makes things even more dicey if we're hoping to get through Onyx. He then hits another critical hit and takes Bolts to 18 HP. Eventually, Bolts is able to knock it out, but with just 10 HP remaining after leveling up, this adventure looks like it's about to be cut short. Onyx comes in and his moves cause all sorts of issues for us. Rock Tomb lowers our speed, and Bind will do damage over time, which may not seem like much, but it really adds up when all we can do in return is hit a tackle. I figured my best chance here was to spam double teams with Mouse Rat in hopes that he'll miss virtually all of his attacks, or get fully paralyzed after the static ability was activated by his Bind. Eventually, he connects with a Rock Tomb, which brings an end to attempt number one. Two thousand years later. On attempt number five, I return to Brock's House of Horrors with Bolts the Fifth and Mouse Rat the Fifth. I make sure to cover their eyes as I walk over the corpses of their predecessors on my way back to Brock. My strategy remains unchanged, as there really aren't any other paths we can walk. This time around, his Geodude goes for Tackle right away, then goes for a second and gets paralyzed due to Static. This means he's at minus two defense after going for yet another tackle as I swap to Bolts the Fifth. Bolts the Fifth lands a Supersonic on the first try, but he breaks through and goes for a defense curl, leaving him at minus one now. On the second turn, he hurts himself in confusion, and as you can see, it does a decent chunk of damage. Bolts the Fifth is able to knock it out with 25 HP remaining after leveling up as Onyx comes in. A Supersonic connects on the first try, and Onyx hurts itself in confusion as I swap to Mouse Rat the Fifth. Onyx then breaks out of confusion and ignores the double team, and then lands a Rock Tomb. Thankfully, Onyx misses a bind, which would have prevented Mouse Rat the Fifth from switching out, and she's able to dodge another as she gets off three Tail Whips. Then I swap back into Bolts the Fifth on a tackle. A Supersonic connects again, and then Bolts the Fifth is hit by a bind, which does two damage in between turns. Onyx finally hits itself in confusion and does a decent chunk of damage to itself. They chip away at each other and Bolts the Fifth is down to just 9 HP and Onyx hurts itself in confusion, which takes it to just 1 HP. Then Bolts the Fifth is able to put an end to this nightmare once and for all and earn us the first badge. 
With Brock finally out of the way, I can head through Mount Moon and make it to Cerulean City. Our rival presents much less of a challenge than Brock, as Bolts the Fifth now knows Sonic Boom and can deal with his Bulbasaur with relative ease. Okay, I don't think those mushrooms I ate with lunch were normal. The second gym leader is Misty, and her water types are a welcome sight after dealing with Brock. Even though we have the type advantage, her Starmie outspeeds us, and a critical hit from Water Pulse would knock out either of our Pokemon in one hit. Staryu outspeeds, but they just go for Harden, and then Bolts the Fifth is able to knock it out in one hit with a Thundershock. Her Starmie comes in and lands a Water Pulse, but thankfully it doesn't get the crit or confusion. Then Bolts the Fifth lands a Thundershock that paralyzes Starmie. This allows them to outspeed on the following turn and knock it out with the second Thundershock. Earning the second badge was a much more pleasant experience than earning the first. Over on the SSN, we have another rival battle, but his team is a bit lower level than us, so he isn't too much of a threat. After picking up the Cut HM from the Captain in exchange for some physical favors, I'm able to access the third gym, which is against Lieutenant Surge and his electric types. On the surface, it may seem like we have a lot in common. Both of us exclusively use electric Pokemon, and we both suffer from PTSD. There is one key difference between us though, and that's that I have the TM for Dig. Mouserat the Fifth is able to outspeed Voltorb and land a Dig, which doesn't do enough for the KO, but still does quite a bit of damage. After taking a Sonic Boom, a second Dig takes it down, and Surge sends in his own Pikachu. Mouserat the Fifth establishes dominance by knocking it out in one hit, then he sends in his Raichu. In spite of being the same level and fully evolved, his Raichu still can't outspeed Mouserat the Fifth so she's able to land a dig which activates Raichu's static ability, but a held cherry berry heals her paralysis. Surge then goes for a double team, but a second dig connects and he survives at literally 1 HP, then lands a thunder wave. That's an unfortunate sequence of events, as now Surge is able to heal with a super potion. Mouserat the fifth goes for another dig and Raichu goes for another double team, then she gets fully paralyzed on the way back up. I'm forced to switch into Bolts the fifth here as Surge shamelessly goes for yet another double team. I figure my best bet is to try and slow it down, so after getting hit with Shockwave, a Thunder Wave is able to connect and paralyze Raichu. He then uses a full heal, but Bolts the fifth is able to hit a Sonic Boom. On the following turn, they're hit with a Shockwave and then miss a Sonic Boom. Another Sonic Boom connects and takes Raichu low. Then Bolts the fifth avoids a critical hit from Shockwave and survives at just 8 HP. Then they land another Sonic Boom for the KO. With Lieutenant Surge out of the way, we can finally add a new member to the team. On Route 10, I catch a Voltorb that I named Pokeball. They have a naughty nature, which is plus attack and minus special defense, which is about as bad as it gets. We were able to navigate through Rock Tunnel on Skate thanks to the combination of Dig and Sonic Boom and get ourselves to Lavender Town, where we can visit the graves of the Magnemite and Pikachu from attempts 1 through 4. After we're done, I head over to Celadon City where I engage in some petty theft and steal an Eevee. I name him Sparky, and then I head over to the department store and pick up a couple of Thunderstones so I can evolve him into a Jolteon and Mouse Rat the Fifth into a Raichu. Before taking on Erika, I head back to Lavender Town and stomp our rival once again. I wanted to give the team a morale boost, cause what comes next is actually quite a challenge. Normally Erika is one of the easiest gym leaders, but her grass type resists our electric moves, so our lack of type coverage is once again causing some serious issues. I lead with Pokeball versus her Victory Bell and set up a light screen, then she misses a Stun Spore. On the following turn, I swap to Bolts the Fifth who gets hit with a Stun Spore, but cures it with a Held Cherry Berry. Bolts the Fifth outspeeds and lands a Thunder Wave, then Victory Bell gets fully paralyzed. The spark doesn't do much damage, and then she gets fully paralyzed once again. We're off to a good start. A second spark takes her to about half, then she's fully paralyzed for a third turn in a row. I don't think I've ever had that happen before. I'm not sure if two more sparks will get the range, and I don't want her to heal, so I opt to go for supersonic which connects, and she hurts herself in confusion. In hindsight, this might have resulted in her healing anyway as spark takes her low, but she hurts herself in confusion again and knocks herself out. That went about as well as it possibly could have. Tangela comes in and Spark does just under half as she goes for Ingrain. A second Spark takes her low and she hits Constrict for a whopping 1 damage. Erika uses a Hyper Potion, then a Spark paralyzes Tangela. Erika then uses a full heal, and a second Spark gets the paralysis again. Well played, Erika. I need to set up another light screen, so I swap into Pokeball who gets hit with a Giga Drain. I didn't consider the Ingrain heal in combination with the Giga Drain heal, which was a mistake. I swap into Mouserat the Fifth, who tanks a Giga Drain well thanks to the light screen. Thunderbolt takes Tangela to the red, and then she hits a Poison Powder. But Mouserat the Fifth is holding a Petra Berry. A Thunderbolt knocks it out on the following turn, and Erika sends in her Vileplume. Thunderbolt doesn't do much. Then Mouserat the Fifth gets hit with a Stun Spore as our light screen wears off. After a few Giga Drains and Thunderbolts, I have to switch. So I send in Sparky, who also does negligible damage with a Shockwave. Sparky then gets hit with a Stun Spore as well, and we're struggling to outdamage her healing from Giga Drains. Sparky gets taken to just 3 HP, and I have to switch back to Bolts the Fifth. 
Thankfully, Vileplume is finally out of Giga Drains, and now its only attacking move is Acid, which doesn't affect Bolts the Fifth. It wasn't the smoothest way to stall her out of Giga Drains, but it got the job done, and we've earned our fourth badge. With the level cap all the way up to 43, I can finally evolve Bolts the Fifth into Magneton, and Pokeball into an Electrode. The upgrades to the team come at a great time, as the normally mundane battle against Giovanni in the Rocket Hideout becomes a bit more tricky, as he has an Onix and a Rhyhorn, although neither of them have a ground type move. Mouserat the Fifth is able to Brick Break his way through both of his rocks, and Kangaskhan comes in. After taking a fake out, she hits a Brick Break. Then she gets hit with a Tail Whip, which forces a switch into Bolts the Fifth. They tank a Mega Punch well, and then two Sparks knocks it out. With the Self Scope, I'm able to rescue Mr. Fuji and get the Poke Flute. I finally get to show off my recorder skills that I picked up in elementary school so I can wake up the Snorlax that's blocking my path. I get to Fuchsia City and I pick up Surf from the Safari Zone, which will be the key to getting the final member of the team. Before I can actually use Surf though, I have to defeat Koga. What I decided to do here was clear out all of the trainers in both Koga and Sabrina's gyms, as well as all of the Rocket Grunts, so the only ones that remain are my rival, Giovanni, and the gym leaders. I can't level up the team to the level cap to face Koga unless I defeat my rival and Giovanni first, but I might need my final encounter for those battles. Thankfully, Koga suffers from the same problem that I do, as his whole team only has normal or poison type moves. This makes Bolts the Fifth the perfect counter to his team. They're able to spark their way through his entire team while only taking a single tackle from Weezing. Now that I have Surf, I can head over to the power plant and catch an Electabuzz. I name her Electra, and she has a Rash Nature, which is plus special attack and minus special defense, which is excellent. If I had gotten a minus special attack nature, this run might not have been possible to complete for reasons that I'll explain later. Neutral or better was pretty much necessary. I'm able to get her special attack EVs by training against Ghastly and Haunter. And most importantly, Electra can learn the move Psychic, which gives the team a stronger answer for ground-type Pokemon. Once she's up to speed, I head back to Sylph Company for another rival battle. I lead with Mouserat the Fifth, and she takes down his Pidgeot with a Thunderbolt after being hit with a Quick Attack. He then sends in his Gyarados, who also goes down to a Thunderbolt. I can't believe that didn't work out for him. His Growlithe also goes down to a Thunderbolt, and in comes Alakazam. He manages to survive a Thunderbolt, but his only attacking move is Future Sight, so he's not much of a threat. Venusaur comes in, so I swap into Pokeball, who gets hit with the Future Sight. They then set up a Light Screen and tank a Razor Leaf. Then I swap into Electra, who gets put to sleep. A Razor Leaf doesn't do much, then she wakes up and hits a Psychic. She tanks one more Razor Leaf and then knocks it out with another Psychic. Next, I head upstairs to take on Giovanni. With Psychic, Electra is able to knock out Nidorino in one hit. Nitto Queen comes in and goes down to two Psychics after hitting a Tail Whip. I leave her in to take the fake out from Kangaskhan, then I swap into Bolts the Fifth, who's able to take it down in a few sparks. Rhyhorn comes in, but it doesn't know any ground type moves. A mistake that Giovanni will overcorrect the next time we see each other. I level everyone up to the level cap, then I head to the next gym to challenge Sabrina to a battle. I lead with Sparky, who I've taught the move Shadow Ball, and even with his poor attack stat, he's able to knock out both Kadabra and Mr. Mime in one hit. Venomoth comes in, so I swap into Electra, who gets hit with a Supersonic. So I switch her out and send in Pokeball, who's able to set up a Light Screen. Then I swap Electra back in for the one-hit KO with Psychic. She sends in her Alakazam, who takes a ton of damage from a Thunder Punch. Then, instead of using Psychic, she just goes for Future Sight. Thunder Punch also had the courtesy of not putting Alakazam into heal range, so a second is able to finish it off and earn us the sixth badge. Normally, I avoid this trainer, as he just has six Magikarp, but today, I wanted to make him suffer. Once I make it to Cinnabar Island, I get the key to Blaine's gym and then challenge him to a gym battle. I lead with Electra, and she's able to one-shot both Growlithe and Ponyta with a Thunderbolt. His Rapidash comes in, and I've taught Electra Light Screen, which in hindsight I should've used against Ponyta. Thanks to the Light Screen, she can tank a Fire Blast pretty well. A Thunderbolt then just misses the KO on Rapidash, but gets the Paralysis. Then a second Fire Blast takes Electra to about half. Blaine is going to heal here, so I send in Pokeball so I can start going for Rollout. Blaine uses a full heal and two rollouts takes Rapidash low. He hits a Fire Blast on the final turn of Light Screen, then a rollout knocks out Rapidash. Arcanine comes in and Intimidate lowers Pokeball's attack stat, but a critical hit from rollout obliterates his ace and earns us the seventh badge. As I exit the gym, I'm approached by Bill, who tries to convince me to get on his boat and sail off into the sunset with him. We're gonna be out on open ocean, right? Right? Any, anything can happen out there. No laws, right, boy? Just us and our tasty treats. 
<laughs> okay, now that was an implication, right? That was definitely the implication. <sighs> tasty treats? Are we the tasty we're treats? We're the tasty treats in this scenario. Yes, we're the tasty treats. They're gonna take us out into the open ocean. They're gonna have their way with us, Mac. We gotta get the hell out of here. After narrowly avoiding being on a missing persons report, I head back to Viridian and get ready for what should be the most difficult battle of this run. Giovanni up to this point hasn't been a serious threat, but his team is a straight up nightmare for electric Pokemon. All five of his Pokemon are part ground type, and all of them know the move Earthquake. The only way this run is even remotely possible is with Electra. As I mentioned earlier, if she had a minus special attack nature, even with maxing out her special attack EVs, she wouldn't be able to guarantee a kill on all of his Pokemon. Because she doesn't have a minus special attack nature, she's able to one hit KO his entire team with Psychic. Before I can head to Victory Road, we have another rival battle, and Electra continues on her rampage and sweeps through his entire team. The trek through Victory Road leads us to our final destination, the Indigo Plateau. I level everyone up to the level cap, and then I attempt to add as much diversity to the move pool as I possibly can, and now we're ready to take on the Elite Four. First up is the Ice-type trainer, Lorelei. Most of her Pokemon are also part Water-type, so this is by far the easiest member of the Elite Four for us. Bolts the Fifth is able to Thunderbolt their way through Dugong, Cloyster, and Slowbro in one hit. She sends out her Lapras and it manages to survive a Thunderbolt on what must be 1 HP, then confuses Bolts the Fifth. So on the heel turn I swap to Electra who also hits Lapras to 1 HP and also gets confused. This time I swap to Sparky on the heel, but Sparky only knows Shockwave. He then also gets confused. Then a swap into Bolts the Fifth results in being hit with a Surf that lands a critical hit. Thankfully they survive and outspeed and finish off the Lapras with a Thunderbolt. Her last Pokemon is her only non-water type Pokemon in Jinx. I swap to Sparky and she misses a Lovely Kiss, then Sparky lands a Shadow Ball for the one hit KO. One down. While Lorelei was as easy as expected, Bruno actually presents a challenge. Normally he's one of the softest members of the Elite Four due to having two Onyx, but in this particular run that's actually what makes him difficult to deal with. Onyx may be laughably weak, but their ground typing and stab earthquake is obviously an issue for any of our electric Pokemon. Or at least it would be, if it weren't for Electra. She's able to one-shot Onyx with a Psychic. Then he sends out his second Onyx, which also goes down to a Psychic. This is great because now if I have to switch out, I don't have to worry about Onyx coming in on one of my other team members. Electra is able to one-shot the Hitmonchan as well. Then Hitmonlee comes in. Hitmonlee then manages to hang on for dear life, but just misses a Mega Kick. Bruno heals and then Hitmonlee goes down as well. Last is his Machamp and this won't be a one-hit KO with Psychic either, which is pretty scary because this thing hits like a truck. A Psychic brings it into Citrus Berry range, but fortunately he just goes for a bulk up instead of attacking, so Electra is able to finish it off on the next turn. Two down. Up third is Agatha. She leads with her Gengar and once again I lead with Electra. Her ability to learn Psychic has been the key to this run so far and that doesn't change here. A Psychic one-shots her first Gengar. Then Golbat comes in and goes down to a Thunderbolt. Her Arbok comes in and manages to survive a Psychic with like 1 HP, then retaliates with a Sludge Bomb, which fortunately doesn't poison or crit. Agatha uses a full restore so I swap to Thunderbolt which takes down Arbok in two hits. She sends in her stronger Gengar, and since Electra took that hit from Sludge Bomb, I decide to swap into Bolts the Fifth, who either resists or is immune to either of her attacking moves, so long as they don't get put to sleep and get hit with Nightmare afterwards. They come in on a Sludge Bomb, which doesn't affect us, then get outsped, but her Gengar misses a Hypnosis. A Thunderbolt takes her into Citrus Berry range, then she misses another Hypnosis. Sucks to suck, Agatha. A second Thunderbolt is able to finish off her Gengar, then her Haunter comes in and gets outsped by Bolts the Fifth, who is not messing around today, and lands a critical hit Thunderbolt for the KO. Three down. The fourth member of the Elite Four is Lance, and while he does have three part flying type Pokemon, he also has a few that resist our electric attacks as well. He leads with Gyarados, who does the opposite of resist electric attacks, and goes down to a Thunderbolt from Masrath the Fifth. His first Dragonair comes in and tanks a Thunderbolt reasonably well, then sets up a safeguard so we can't paralyze any of his Pokemon. This Dragonair uses Dragon Rage, so I now know the other one is the one with Thunder Wave. Because he resists our Thunderbolts, it actually causes them to be a clean 3-hit KO while managing to avoid putting him into heal range. The second Dragonair comes in and I'm assuming he's going to go for Thunder Wave, so I stay in and hit another Thunderbolt. He now outspeeds and lands a critical hit Outrage, and Mouserat the Fifth gets brought down to just 25 HP. Her Thunderbolt connects and brings Dragonair relatively low, but now I have to switch. I send in Bolts the Fifth, who Steel Typing once again proves to be invaluable to the team as they easily tank the Outrage. Then they retaliate with a completely unnecessary critical hit Thunderbolt for the KO. His Dragonite comes in, who now takes neutral damage from our electric moves instead of resisting them, and a Thunderbolt does a bit less than half. Outrage does a solid chunk of damage, but still not enough to be concerned about. A second Thunderbolt manages to paralyze Dragonite, and brings it into Citrus Berry range, which prevents Lance from using a full restore. Bolts the Fifth is then able to knock it out on the following turn. 
His last Pokemon is Aerodactyl, which hits a weak Ancient Power, which doesn't get the Omni Boost. Then it goes down to a super effective Thunderbolt. With Lance now defeated, there's only one person standing in our way, and that's our rival. Throughout this run, he's been a bit of a punching bag for the team. The constant defeat and subsequent ridicule by myself and my team of electric Pokemon has pushed him to the brink. This time around, he has a Rhydon that knows Earthquake. And while it does absolutely nothing, having the Lightning Rod ability makes it feel like a slap in the face. He leads off with Pidgeot, and I send in Bolts to 5th. I set up a Reflect in order to deal with Rhydon a bit better. Then after getting hit with a Feather Dance, I swap into Pokeball, who gets hit with a weak Aerial Ace. Pokeball is too weak to KO the Pidgeot with Spark, then gets nailed with a Sand Attack. Thankfully, that doesn't cause them to miss, and a second Spark takes down the Pidgeot. Rhydon comes in, and I want to hit it with a Toxic, but the combination of its mediocre accuracy and the Sand Attack causes Pokeball to miss. Rhydon then decides to go for Rock Tomb instead of Earthquake, presumably because it isn't a one-hit KO with Reflect Up and we outspeed, but still a questionable decision at best. It whiffs on the attempt and our Reflect wears off. Not hitting Toxic on the first turn was pretty bad, but the second does connect, and Earthquake then puts an end to Pokeball. I was hoping to let them go out on their own terms with an explosion, and have control over the final moments of their life. But that's not how the world works. It's a cruel and dark place sometimes. This means I have to send in Mouse Rat the Fifth, who's been with us since the start. She managed to do what her ancestors couldn't, and got to see the world that existed beyond Pewter City and experience a long and happy life. Sadly, her time is also coming to an end. Psychic isn't a one-hit KO against Rhydon like it has been against most of the other ground types we face so far. So Mouse Rat the Fifth is going to have to do some damage with Brick Break in order for Electra to save the team from certain doom. She hits a Brick Break, then gets taken down by an Earthquake. Her sacrifice allows Electra to come in and with the Toxic and Brick Break damage, allows her to KO with a Psychic. This of course lands a critical hit which would have done enough damage to KO at full HP. So that's a bit depressing knowing that technically, Pokeball and Mouse Rat the Fifth died in vain. Alakazam comes in and it finally knows something other than Future Sight. Electra outspeeds and sets up a light screen which allows her to easily tank a Psychic. She hits a Thunderbolt which paralyzes Alakazam which is awful because his synchronized ability causes Electra to be paralyzed as well. On the following turn she gets fully paralyzed, then Alakazam goes for recover. Thankfully he doesn't recover enough HP to avoid going down on the following turn to a Thunderbolt. Gyarados comes in and because of the paralysis Electra can't outspeed, and I need her for Venusaur, so I swap into Sparky who gets hit with a Dragon Rage. Sparky is then able to knock it out with a 4x super effective Shockwave. Arcanine comes in and I really don't have an effective way of dealing with it. Sparky is able to learn the move Rain Dance, which weakens his flamethrowers, but it also gives Thunder 100% accuracy. After being hit to just 27 HP with extreme speed, Sparky lands a Thunder which takes Arcanine low. I know he's going for another extreme speed here, and in hindsight I should have just sacrificed Sparky, but I've lost too many friends already. So I swap into Bolts the Fifth who tanks it well. Bolts the Fifth is then able to outspeed the Arcanine thanks in part to their timid nature, and gets the KO with the Thunderbolt. That just leaves his Venusaur, whose only attacking move is Solar Beam. It does no growth and synthesis, which makes it a bit scary if it manages to set up some special attack boosts though. I land a Thunder Wave and then he sets up the Sun. Bolts the Fifth then lands a critical hit Thunderbolt which takes it to below half and activates his Citrus Berry. Then he sets up a growth. After another Thunderbolt, Venusaur heals to full with synthesis. Another Thunderbolt hits and then he goes for another growth. Another Thunderbolt takes it to half and then he's fully paralyzed as the sunlight fades. With the sunlight faded and Venusaur paralyzed, he would need to take two turns to hit another Solar Beam. So I swap back into Electra and he goes for another Synthesis. Electra and Venusaur then both get paralyzed on the following turn. Then I set up a light screen as Venusaur isn't a one-hit KO from here with Psychic. Venusaur then goes for a Solar Beam, but after tanking a Psychic, gets paralyzed so the Solar Beam never goes off. Then we both get paralyzed again. Electra finally breaks through for the final blow, earning us the victory and winning us the challenge. That one was a lot of fun. Well, aside from the five times that I had to battle Brock. With these last two runs I've attempted, I've gained a new appreciation for the Glass Cannon types. Their ability to constantly one-hit KO our biggest threats helps circumvent their drawbacks. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, as it really helps me out a lot. And if you want to see more content like this, then consider subscribing to the channel as well. If you want to see another interesting challenge, consider clicking on the video that's on the screen right now. It's about time for me to head out. Thanks for watching, and I'll smell you later.